know. And um, so anyway, when I got down there and got setting everything up, the main camera that I had, I grabbed the wrong power cord. Yeah. And so I went, well, but I remembered picking up my spare camera. It's, it looks like a, a, a 35 millimeter camera, but it records video. And so I set it all up, had it plugged into the power source and hit record, but it didn't record very long. For some reason, it wasn't pulling power from the power cord, it was pulling power from the battery. And when the battery got dead, it just shut off. Yeah, so the first three nights, nothing. So I set up the last two nights, I set up one tablet, I have a Samsung tablet, I set it up uh, to record video, and then I set my uh, phone up to record audio. I had it sitting on the pulpit. So I've got the last two nights teaching, and I'll start editing those probably this afternoon, try to get them uh, released uh, in the morning. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, the, the two witnesses, and uh, some interesting things here. In verse 3, I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Who remembers what prophet in the Old Testament he's referring to here? When he mentions the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, who remembers what prophet spoke of the two olive trees and the two candlesticks? It's always some guy's got to be out, outsmart everybody else, right? Yeah, it's that, it's, that, it's that cop instinct in him. He just knows. It was Zechariah. And uh, Zechariah gave a lot of details. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Boy, these guys are preaching the gospel and they're fierce about it. Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Let's go back up to verse 5. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Um, who in here thinks that that is a literal fire coming out of their mouth? I do. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's no, no, no doubt about it. Uh, when, <laughs> when I was in uh, Bible college, I took a class on the book of Revelation. And it was taught by an amillennial professor. Meaning that he didn't believe in the literal interpretation of Revelation. They had this, they concocted this idea that Revelation was written in the style of a type of literature that was popular back then called apocalyptic literature. And uh, that uh, what John was really referring to uh, when he talked about the beast he was really referring to the Caesar of Rome, the Roman emperor. And um, so everything in the book of Revelation is figurative. It's a symbol of something. It's a metaphor, but it's not, it's not actually real. And it doesn't actually prophesy of times that are yet to come in the last days. And I'm, just, I'm listening to this, and I mean, he taught it well, he also taught premillennialism well, um, but I just wasn't buying it, George. I mean, I just, no way. I'm going, well, it says a thousand years, and that's, that was one of their things. Ah, millennial means no millennial. And so they believe that the thousand years is a really, really long time. It's a big number. And so the thousand years is symbolic of a long period of time, and they believe that Christ is ruling right now, and the devil is bound. Who believes that one? 
No, I couldn't believe it either. But that's what they believe. And uh, you can give them scripture after scripture and scripture, and they, they won't budge. For the most part, they won't budge. But anyway, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. In uh, 2 Samuel 22, let's turn there. 2 Samuel 22. Uh, I could always tell at this church uh, who knew their Bible and who didn't. And some people, uh, I'm not real sure, even brought a Bible. I think that's bad. I think you ought to bring a Bible to church. Amen? Have you ever seen where the city will set up, like if there's a church there in a neighborhood, they'll put a sign there. It's one of those yellow caution signs. And it is the silhouette of a man and a woman walking. And what is the guy holding in his hand? The Bible. Okay? Even the city knows that when you go to church, take a Bible with you. 2 Samuel 22, verse 4. I will call on the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Now, that, that word, the floods, think of as it was in the days of Noah. And God promised, he swore, and he gave the sign of the rainbow in the sky. He swore that he would not destroy the earth with floodwaters ever again. But he, and he's not. But what kind of flood is going to encompass the earth in the last days? It's not water. Here he says, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Um, you know, one of the issues in the election this year is the border and it is a crisis my wife was looking at facebook last night and she pulled up this guy and uh he said that he used to be a die hard democrat but he said when he starts looking at the issues he said he sees this flood of people coming across the border millions of them coming across the border no papers, no identification, no accounting of who they are. And yet when they get here, we give them food stamps, pay for an apartment, give them all kinds of money and all this stuff. And uh, that stuff just, I'm, I'm one of those that says, that's not right. Even New Jerusalem coming down from heaven has, has a wall around it, has gates. And there's certain people that can go in and certain people that can't go in. And uh, God's certainly not unfair, nor is he uncompassionate. But if you're not right with God, if you're one of the five foolish virgins, no oil in your lamp, you're not going in. So we're looking at right now a flood of uh, people who are not legally here. So in the last days, there's going to be a flood of ungodly men making people afraid. And then he mentions in verse 6, the sorrows of hell compass me about. The snares of death prevented me. That sort of sounds like uh, what Jonah was saying in the, in the uh, whale's belly. Uh, verse 7, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. And I want to throw this in here real quick. If somebody ever tells you that when you're praying, you must enunciate correctly exactly what you want, when you want it, how you want it, or God cannot answer that prayer, they're lying. They have believed a lie and they have spread this lie. The Bible tells us Number one, we know not what we should pray for. So the Holy Ghost helps our infirmities and uh, speaks things to God that we can't even utter. Then, if you look through the book of Psalms, and this, I'm pretty sure this, um, this passage here is in the book of Psalms. I'm not positive, but I think it is. 
But anyway, uh, when you look through the book of Psalms, you'll see that over and over. David said, I cried unto the Lord. I cried out unto the Lord. And uh, I'm, I'm just of the firm belief that God knows way more about what I need than I do. And I don't have to ask God and make it very specific. Uh, most of the time when I pray, um, I will just say, God, I need help. You're the one who can help me. No one else can. So God, I don't care what you do as long as you're the one doing it. And uh, you might want to underline this passage in your Bible. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. I mean, think of a, uh, a woman who uh, has a young child. She hears that child out screaming and crying. Uh, she's not going to stand there and wait for that child to tell her exactly what he needs and how he needs it. She's the mother. She's the one that's going to figure that out and do it. Uh, verse 8, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook. This is actually a prophecy of that's, that's going to happen. Uh, Hebrews mentions it, that God, is going to, that God is going to shake the earth and He's going to shake heaven as well. We also see that in Revelation 6. When the uh, sixth seal is broken, um, all of the stars of heaven, not all of them, but the stars of heaven fell to the earth like a fig tree casting her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So in those days, there's going to be a shaking of the earth and there's going to be a shaking of heaven. And God's going to shake out a whole bunch of bad angels. When he shakes the earth... Uh, the book of Revelation, we haven't got this far yet, but in Revelation 16, and I know this so well because I just read it yesterday, I think. In Revelation 16, let me look at this here so I can say it right. Revelation 16. Um. Where does it say that? Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm thinking of it being somewhere else. Uh, but God talks about how he's going to shake the earth. All the mountains are going to be brought down. All the valleys are going to be brought up. And apparently God's going to even the land out throughout all the earth. And that's going to be... Uh, ready for the 1,000 year reign of Christ. I thought it was in Revelation 16, but I don't see it just jumping. Huh? Verse 20? Well, maybe I'd get turned the page. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. There you go. Good job. Uh, so yeah, that's God's going God's to flood all the islands and the mountains were not found. Boy, that's a lot of power God has. So anyway, the earth shook, back in uh, 2 Samuel, the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. And when you are wroth, then you pour out wrath. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. And so here the power of God, whereby he has fire coming out of his mouth and it devours things. Uh, this power is going to be given over to these two witnesses. Um, God said that his words are like a fire. Turn to Jeremiah 5. Jeremiah 5. Boy, I almost turned right to it. Jeremiah 5, verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. Interesting point that Jeremiah is making, and yet for all of their treachery, God still loves them. And uh, if you're like me, you have these days where you wonder why God ever saved you, you wonder how God puts up with you, why God has been so good to you, why He's blessed you, why He's given you things. 
why he's taught you from his word. Uh, you may wonder at that and say, God, I'm, I'm just about worthless. I'm a sinner. And I don't, know, I don't know the way out. But you call unto God, you cry unto him, God will show you the way out. And even though we have, we have broken God's commandments, we violated his covenant, God still loves us. God loves Israel enough, when he, even though he says Judah and Israel both have dealt very treacherously against the Lord. And yet, that's Jeremiah 5, and over in Jeremiah 31, God simply says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And he says, it's not going to be like the Mount Sinai covenant, Mount Sinai said you had to do these commandments in order to live. But God doesn't say that here in Jeremiah 31. He simply says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And God basically in verse 34, he says, I'm just going to forgive their iniquity and I'm going to remember their sin no more. And uh, what does Israel do to deserve that? Not a thing. But he's going to remember the covenant that he made with Abraham and he's going to keep that covenant. So, uh, make my, uh, so he says here in verse 12, They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Mm -mm -mm. Has anybody besides me ever thought about the possibility that our country could come under such great attack that we literally have enemies in our country taking over. Yeah. I mean, if God's going to hold true to his word, I would say it's going to happen um, because of the iniquity that is all over this country. It's everywhere. And um, people in America, they're not looking for God. They don't care about God. I was thinking about this last night. And uh, I was looking at the pictures that we get from Kenya and the feeding. And um, those people over there, when you get ready to hand out Bibles, you realize you never have enough. They will line up and they'll take a Bible from you and you don't have to beg them. You don't have to ask them. Nothing. They want a Bible. I saw that in Kilimambogo. Uh, Brother Mike Hutzel had arranged to have Bibles distributed and he said very plainly and it was told to the people that he wants the, the men to come up, the heads of families, and... Um, and get a Bible for their family. That didn't happen. They all came up. One after another. And we gave out as many Bibles as we had. Gave everyone. I think it was like 300 Bibles. Something like that. And um, you couldn't do that here in, in America. I couldn't go out here to Walmart and set up a little stand and hand out free Bibles. People don't want it. They think it's... Bunch of nonsense. They ain't got time for religion. They ain't got time for anything. And uh, God is watching that. So certainly, nobody in America ever thinks that there's going to be a famine in this country or that the sword is going to come against us. But I think it's very, very possible that God would allow that to happen. In verse 13, he said, The prophets shall become wind, and the word is not in them. Benny Hinn goes around blowing on people. I don't know if you've seen him do that. But he will. People will come up and he'll like that. They'll act, whether it's an act or what, they'll fall backward. Or in some, he's, there's videos of him, he takes his coat off and swings his coat at everybody and all of a sudden, dozens of people fall backward. That's all a show, a put on. 
the man doesn't have the word of God in him. All he has is make me wealthy, make me rich. The prophets shall become when and the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done unto them. Uh, Amos said that there be a time when there's going to be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread or of water, but of hearing the words of God. So verse 14, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. God gave Jeremiah figuratively this power that the people are going to be wood when Jeremiah preaches the word of God and says this is thus saith the Lord when he preaches that to those people it devours them and um, so once again you have the the symbolism the fire coming out of their mouth um, then and that's indicative of uh, let's see who did we say any man, the fire proceeded out of their mouth. And then verse 6 is where I think that it's probably, speaking of Elijah, there is a prophecy saying that Elijah will return. But in verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. When's the last time we had a good rain here? Been quite a while, we can't remember it. Okay, and um, they were talking about this. I didn't even know there was a hurricane until I got down to Lebanon and uh, looked on the weather thing, and they were talking about a hurricane coming up, and it was supposed to come up all the way into Missouri and dump all this rain. Didn't happen, did it? I mean, I came back on Friday, and I got a little sprinkled on. They had a pretty good rain there. I guess we'll all move to Arnold if we want rain. But anyway... Uh, imagine what it would be like if it didn't rain in America for three and a half years. You think Lake Mead is shallow now. Wait till the, Lake Mead is the, they get all that snow runoff from the Snake River. And um, they use it to generate electricity, but they also use it to send water to places like Las Vegas and L.A., so imagine it not raining for three and a half years in this country. Um, God did something similar to this back in the 1930s with the Depression. And to compound the Depression because of the bankers and all of that, um, you had the Dust Bowl. And if you've ever done any study into that, um, the ground got so parched and dry and the temperature was so hot that when the wind would blow, it would pick up all of this loose dirt and basically it was creating its own weather system. The more dirt that was picked up in the air, the more the winds blew and the more dirt that it picked up. And all that good topsoil that those farmers were counting on to plant their crops was gone and many people lost their farms many people died of starvation died in in abject poverty and um, it could happen again in this country they have power to shut heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood that sounds like Moses to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will again sounds like Moses now when Elijah cut off the, um, the rain, that it didn't rain for three and a half years, how many days did he spend praying for that? Was it, was it seven days? Was it 40 days? How many days did Elijah spend praying that the heaven would be shut up? Does anybody know? One person knows. Huh? Turn to James 5. Thank you very much for that. Derek. One prayer. Verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. He does not say confess your sins. 
and you ought to thank God for that. Uh, some things are private. Some things are best left unsaid. But one of the, the greatest blessings that you can be to someone is if someone comes to you and says, I don't know who to talk to, but I need to get something off my chest. And you being a faithful person, they come to you and they confess their faults to you, and you don't go out then and try to use that against them. You don't go out and tell everybody what you told them. And um, there's, there's no feeling in the world like someone that you trusted becoming like a Judas, betraying that trust. And the things that you tell them, the things that you confide in them, they go out and blab to other people. Uh, one of the things that I've found out over the years of being in the ministry, being a pastor, uh, legally, and this, this came about um, as a result of all of these people that um, um, had, they were pedophile priests, and the priests would go in to the confessional and would confess to another priest that he had been molesting children, and uh, that priest then, according to the church rules, could not divulge that to anybody for any reason. And there was more than one priest pulled in uh, by, a, by a prosecutor or whatever and saying, I'm going to put you on the stand and you're going to tell us what that priest said to you. And they'll, they'll say, no, you can't, you can't make me do that. That's between me and that person. Well, Congress passed a law. I don't know when they did it, but they passed a law. And they said that, yes, the confessional is... Uh, a private place there is an expectation of privacy and so there are things that you tell to a priest he cannot divulge those things however the law now says that if he confesses harming a child in any way um, you have to turn him in you have to you have to call the hotline or call the cops or whatever and turn that person in there's no way around it um, I had that situation uh, last year or maybe a couple years ago, a young lady uh, that was going to this church, uh, she told me uh, that uh, her mom's husband was uh, messing with her. And I told her, I said, um, I'm just going to tell you this. I have to call this in. I have, to, uh, I have to turn this person in for doing that. And she said, go ahead. She was tired of living under it. Uh, but anyway... Um, things that are told to me as a minister, as a, as a pastor, those things are kept in confidence. And I cannot tell another soul unless you either give me permission or you're out telling everybody around what you told me. If you go around telling other people what you told me, there's not an expectation of privacy. That's how I see it. But anyway, um, things that... I've had people come to me with burdens, sins in their life, and um, they tell me these things. And I'll tell you this, it doesn't change my opinion of them when they tell me the things that they're guilty of. I actually appreciate these people greater or better because they were willing to divulge certain things. And... Um, that gives me the, the incentive then to pray for them and to try to counsel with them and encourage them. Hey, um, you know, God loves you and God wants to help you with this. And so, um, but like I say, you tell things to people in private, tell it to people on Facebook or whatever, and there's been more than one person telling people on Facebook things about them and then lo and behold, they find out that person's blabbing it all over the place. Don't use Facebook to confess anything. And I had somebody confess 
some pretty bad things. It didn't involve a child, but they confessed to me some pretty bad things. But they did it in a comment. And I said, don't, don't do that. Okay, because everybody then sees it. But anyway, um, there's nothing, nothing like that. So anyway, back to the scriptures here. Uh, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Pray. Things going bad, pray about them. Heartaches, pray. Body aches, pray. Um, sin in your life, pray. God is a loving God. God is a forgiving God. Then he says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. You know what God's doing here? He's telling you that Elijah was no more special than anybody else was. All of us are made, we're from Adam. The word Adam means red dirt because we were all born of Adam. We're born out of the dirt to the earth and to that dust we're going to return again. And uh, Elias was no special person. He wasn't Saint Elias. He wasn't the Pope of anything. He wasn't a high priest. He certainly wasn't a prophet when God called him, but now he's a prophet. And Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again. Let me read this. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's Again, that's Revelation 11. That's how long these two witnesses uh, testify. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Pray. Pray. Ask God things. Ask God big things. Things that you think are impossible. I'm telling you, nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Learn how to pray. Learn how to give things to God in prayer. Learn how to yield yourself over to God. Pray and then wait. And that's probably one of the hardest things for us to do is pray to God and then wait for God to do something. Yes, sir. Say, God help. I mean, I, that's what I was getting at a while ago. You go through the Psalms. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Um, let me look at another one here. O Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion. I mean... The whole thing, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me. I mean, Psalms is full of crying out to God and just saying, God, help me. God, help me. And anybody can do that. No matter how bad it is, any one of us can ask God just simply, God, I need your help today. I need your help. Yes, Derek. Exactly. And that's where the fear comes from. Yep. God knows about it. God always knows about it. And, and like I said, the hardest part for us is accepting God's grace um, when God doesn't just jump up and do exactly what you ask Him to do right then and there. One of the hardest things for us to do is wait on the Lord. But I'm telling you, it is the best thing. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, eagles, uh, with wings as eagles. And um, learn how to trust in that. Learn how to wait on the Lord for God to give His answer. Okay? Father, we love You and we thank You for this Word. We ask God that You bless Your Word as it goes forth in our hearts. And Lord, help us, dear God, to believe You and to trust in You more and more each day. And Father, there's no doubt, Lord, that amongst all the people, Lord, who call themselves members and friends of Bethel, there's no doubt, Lord, that some people are in anguish. Some today, Lord, are grieving. 
Some people today, Lord, are worried over their sins, worried over other people. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would show and manifest your kindness to each one of them, to all of those who call upon you and call upon your holy name. Father, we thank you for this book and the words, Lord, that guide us through our lives. We don't know how to live this life except we follow your word. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant your blessings to your people this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.